It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. Fifteen years ago this week, then Secretary of State Colin Powell made his infamous address to the UN selling the case for a war on Iraq. When we confront a regime that harbors ambitions for regional domination, hides weapons of mass destruction, and provides haven and active support for terrorists, we are not confronting the past. We are confronting the present. And unless we act, we are confronting an even more frightening future. Now today in 2018, a former U.S. official who helped Powell write that speech is warning of a repeat under President Trump. But this time he says the target is Iran. Writing in the New York Times, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson says, quote, the Trump administration is using much the same playbook. Only this war with Iran would be 10 to 15 times worse than the Iraq war in terms of casualties and costs, unquote. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson is the former chief of staff to Colin Powell and now a distinguished professor at the College of William and Mary. Welcome, Colonel Wilkerson. So the title of your piece is, I helped sell the false choice of war once, it's happening again. How so? I think what you're seeing with people like the UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, a neoconservative par excellence, and other people from the wings, as it were, as we had during the March war with Iraq. Richard Pearl, for example, was one of the most effective of those people from the wings, like the FDD, who are pushing what was the agenda originally with regard to Iraq and it's being the first state to go. In other words, they wanted to do Syria. They've tried that, incidentally and they wanted to do Iran. They wanted to sweep the Middle East uh, for various and sundry reasons, not least of which was Israel's security, uh, oil and so forth. But they wanted basically to sweep the Middle East. We're seeing that influence on the Trump administration uh, in terms of people like Haley and others, as I said, very pronounced right now. And it worries me because the scenarios are so similar um, the only thing different here is, as I said in the op-ed, the outcomes are going to be significantly worse and at a minimum, a disastrous outcome of the Iraq war started in 2003 is very apparent to us now, the destabilization of the entire region from Afghanistan to Iran and all the way over to Aden and Yemen. Um, this is all part and parcel of our having destroyed the balance of power in the Persian Gulf by essentially invading Iraq in 2003. Well, let me ask you, Colonel, uh, this warmongering that you're seeing now against Iran, do you think it, in the Trump administration's um, playbook, it winds up similar to Iraq, which is a, a direct uh, U.S. bombing and invasion? I think what we'll see with the Trump administration is that the military people advising him, most prominently H.R. McMaster and Jim Mattis, if they can't stop this, will uh, more or less try to constrain it initially, at least, to U.S. air power. And I don't think it's going to be much more than U.S. air power. That will probably lead to a deeper involvement, as this sort of thing usually does. Look at Libya, for example, and Libya was a much easier target than Iran. Um, and we'll wind up being sucked into what will be an inevitable conclusion that the only way you assure yourself that Iran does not then, once it's bombed, have a clandestine nuclear program one that's deep underground, one that's like North Korea's, for example, and one that is intent on building nuclear weapons rather than what we have now, which is through the nuclear agreement with Iran, an absolute halt to their building anything that even remotely resembles a nuclear weapon. So you're going to have to put troops on the ground. You're going to have to go into Iran. You're going to have to invade. You're going to have to probably sweep the country. This takes a half a million troops. Think full mobilization think the draft coming back, and you're going to have to spend three to five trillion dollars, and you'll probably have to occupy for at least a decade, and at the end of that decade, 
you will have even more destabilization of the region. Let's look at the truth. Iran is one of the most stable countries in the region right now. We will totally destabilize that country and its neighbors once again, and we'll have a true mess on our hands. I, I got an email from an individual today, former ambassador for the United States, who said, right on, Larry, with regard to the New York Times op-ed. And he also said, you know, the future is the future of the collapse of empire. Well, he didn't mean the British or the Spanish or the French, he meant the American empire. And I could see that happening, and it's by historians judged, initial event being the invasion of Iraq, but its seminal event being the subsequent invasion of Iran. But let me ask you, Colonel, I mean, you have experience uh, in with uh, U.S. invasions of foreign countries. Uh, you were there and helped make the case for invading Iraq. Uh, you also served under Colin Powell when he was chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when the U.S. invaded Panama. And in both Iraq and Panama, that's a case where the U.S. invades countries that it knows can't fight, but can't really fight back. So doesn't the fact that Iran actually would put up a fight act as a deterrent to a, a potential U.S military action against it? I don't think so. In fact, I'll tell you that the military assessment of the Iranian ability to fight, quote unquote, um, is pretty low. Pretty, uh, their ability is pretty poor. We saw that in the Iran-Iraq war. Let's face it, they fought Iraq and we beat in a matter of hours and days, twice. They fought Iraq uh, it, for eight years and it was pretty much a stalemate when they came to the end. So in terms of fighting the IRGC or fighting the Iranian professional military and all its branches and arms, um, we'd overwhelm them pretty quickly. It's not that that gives me concern. What gives me concern is that Iran is not Iraq by any stretch of the imagination. And look what a mess we made from 2004 to about 2011 in Iraq. Multiply that by 10 or 15 times. You've got a country not of 25 to 26 million people, but of 80 million people that is basically not divided into sex like Iraq was. One could argue Iraq's not even a national entity, but it's homogeneous. Its population is over 50 percent Persian. It's fairly um, what I would call national in its outlook. And the quickest way to turn the young people who dominate in Iran now population wise Oh, against the United States is to start a campaign against Iran where they're bombed and they're killed. This is a huge country with great strategic depth. Alexander the Great almost died in Iran. It will be very difficult, very time consuming, very treasury consuming, blood consuming. It will be an extremely difficult situation of guerrilla war. And I will tell you that every Marine, soldier, sailor, airman who goes into the region will immediately have a red bullseye on his or her back, not just for Iranian guerrillas, but for every terrorist in the region who has a reason to kill a U.S. soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or what have you. And that's a lot. It could, at the end of the day, be over 400 million people who are so angry, so mad, so willing to take up arms that they wind up being a part of this guerrilla war that will spread to the entire region. So speaking of the entire region, uh, I want to go to a clip uh, of Secretary of State Rex Tillerson uh, speaking recently where he announced effectively an indefinite uh, U.S. military presence inside Syria. Um, and he cited among the reasons Iran. Yes. U.S. disengagement from Syria would provide Iran the opportunity to further strengthen its position in Syria. As we have seen from Iran's proxy wars and public announcements, Iran seeks dominance in the Middle East and the destruction of our ally Israel. As a destabilized nation and one bordering Israel, Syria presents an opportunity that Iran is all too eager to exploit. So that's Rex Tillerson uh, speaking recently at Stanford University, citing Iran as one of the reasons why the U.S. needs to remain in Syria indefinitely. And on this front about Syria, Colonel, um, there was a report last week uh, from Reuters uh, called U.S. says Syria may be developing new types of chemical weapons. 
and it quoted anonymous U.S. officials saying that the Syrian government may be developing new types of chemical weapons, and President Trump is prepared to consider further military action if necessary to deter chemical attacks, senior U.S. officials said. Now, of course, these officials were um, anonymous, and one of them said, we, we reserve the right to use military force to prevent or deter the use of chemical weapons. So I'm wondering your thoughts here. Uh, we're seeing Tillerson openly say that Iran is a reason for U.S. forces to say to stay in Syria. And now we have a familiar playbook uh, similar to Iraq, where we have anonymous U.S. officials warning about potential use of chemical weapons and uh, ma maintaining the U.S. right to use military force against it. Oh, you answered your own question. Of course, this is a repeat of the very same kind of propagandizing of the American people and to a certain extent, the international community by forces within or working for or outside the U.S. government to prepare the nation for war with Iran. Secretary Tilson's 17 January speech at Stanford was one of a high degree, I think, of inexperience and even, I'll say, ignorance. Secretary Tillerson simply doesn't know what he's talking about. The Israelis are the most potent modern military force in the region. The very idea that Iran, either through Hezbollah or through its own IRGC or other military elements in Syria could threaten Israel is preposterous. It is a figment of Bibi Netanyahu's political opportunistic imagination because that's the only way he can hold is very difficult coalition, political coalition together. He has so many hard right-wing, ultra-orthodox, small parties in that coalition. For example, they're now closing Israeli businesses in various Israeli cities because that group does not want the Bible violated in terms of working on the Sabbath. That's how much power these people have. But if anyone were to threaten the state of Israel in a significant way, Iran in particular, uh, Bibi Netanyahu and the Israeli military force would stop that threat pretty quick. So it's preposterous to argue that way. And it's preposterous even more so to argue that the United States needs to say, stay substantially in Syria for purposes of confronting Iran when what we're doing in Syria right now is further destabilizing the region. We're illegal. Others there, like the Russians, are not. We are causing our ally and NATO member, Turkey, to consider other options and very seriously consider other options. We are causing them actually to fight and to be killed in northern Syria as they try to take on those people whom we've armed and they fear, the various Kurdish groups. This is a mess of the very first order of magnitude, and we have largely made it, and Mr. Tillerson's prescriptions delivered at Stanford will simply exacerbate that mess. All right, so finally, what do you think accounts for uh, this uh, longtime desire to uh, confront Iran in the uh, bipartisan U.S. foreign policy establishment? Because it's not just Bush or Trump who has wanted to confront Iran. It's received bipartisan support going back many years. The explanation, given, the, the explanation given by someone like Noam Chomsky is that it's not because Iran threatens anyone's security, but simply it's because Iran acts as a deterrent uh, in some ways to U.S. and Israeli aggression in the region through primarily its support of uh, Hezbollah and also uh, the, the Assad government in Syria. That's the principal reason, long-term reason. Uh, there's a psychological reason, too, and that is that they beat us in 1979. They toppled the Shah and they threw us out. Um, a lot of that was our own incompetence, but nonetheless, that's how we view it, is they did it. So there's that psychological um, umbrella over us, if you will, and it's not a good one. It's a self-defeating one. It makes, it makes us look at the Persians, the Iranians, as something uh, that we have to rectify as a country that got us, so we have to get them back. Don't discount that. That's a big Have you witnessed that, Colonel? Colonel, have you witnessed that? But when you speak to U.S. officials, policymakers, do they display that mentality to you? That we have to teach people a lesson? Neoconservatives in particular do. Um, if you get them in a corner and get them down to the brass tacks, they'll say, well, look what they did in 1979. You can't trust them. You can't 
count on them for anything other than uh, disingenuousness and danger and so forth. So you have, you have to take care of them. But you have to remember, too, that when I was in the Pentagon in 2002, I was being briefed by stars in the Pentagon that we were going to go after Iraq, then we were going to do Syria, then we were going to do Iran. So this is all about in one sense, the messianic desire to bring democracy to all these people who don't have it and to bring freedom and liberty in the American way. And don't forget American commerce too, but to more compliant people than currently are in charge. So that's part of it too. And a big part of it is the very fact that that region presents us with a challenge which we have never really been able to handle not since the Shah left and was our man in Iran and handled it for us. So though it's been since Jimmy Carter declared it so, a vital interest of the United States, and I would say open parentheses, it no longer is, close those parentheses, lots of reasons for that, but it no longer is. But we have had this visceral strategic interest in making sure no one who didn't totally or near totally agree with us never becomes hegemonic, never becomes very powerful. And so we do all manner of things to keep that from happening. And we'll leave it there. The piece in the New York Times is called, I Helped Sell the False Choice of War Once. It's happening again. And it's by our guest, Lawrence Wilkerson, former chief of staff to Colin Powell, now a distinguished professor at the College of William & Mary. Colonel Wilkerson, thank you. Thanks for having me here. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.